Greetings, first tech challenge community and everybody who loves to build and program robots. So last year during the pandemic lockdown, my team decided it's finally time to add some odometry to their robot. And they did. With the help of Google, gluten-free and other online resources, they came up with a pretty good solution. So being an engineer, I thought it would be nice to derive the math from basic principles myself. So I sat down with a blank sheet of paper and a pencil and did the math that I would like to share with you. So sit down, relax and enjoy. All right, three, two, one, go. Way, way back, our team relied mainly on motor encoders for odometry during autonomous. Then we switched to Mechano wheels for obvious reasons and we needed an IMU to keep the robot going straight and for precise turns. Well, at least kind of. Anyway, as you can see, using Mechano wheels during autonomous became a reality. But still, the software needed a lot of tweaking to make it reliable. A couple years ago, we went to MTI, the Maryland Tech Invitational, to finally meet the famous gluten-free team in person. Steven and Peter had implemented an odometry system with three dead wheels and took out the competition left and right. They gave us a close look at their robot and answered all the technical questions we had. Then in 2020, the pandemic hit. The first championship got canceled and the world went into lockdown. We learned how to use Zoom and with all the outside activities canceled, our students all of a sudden had a lot of time on their hands. To fight a summer of boredom, they decided to design and build an odometry system for their robot. In social isolation, the team was split up in four. Timothy became the master in CAD using Onshape. Safi and Pippa would build the whole thing. Reese and Druva had to write the software and Becca collected everything for our engineering notebook. We picked the REF through bore encoder because of its insane accuracy and easy integration with the REF controller. And that's the design in Onshape. And that's how the so-called Odopods turned out once all the parts were 3D printed and CNC cut. Three of them are mounted onto the drive base to record the robot's movements. What up? The drive base in full action for the first time. All that's left is writing some software. But who gets the drive base now? The hardware geeks or the software nerds? Go build out to the rescue. Last year, they had a $150 promotion for the new Striver chassis and I signed up for the raffle. And bingo, here came another drive base. A huge shout out and big thanks to GoBuilder for such great support for the FTC community. More 3D prints, more CNCing for three more Autopods. By the end of summer, we had two drive bases, one for the hardware team to start with attachments and one for the coders to work on autonomous movements. Well, our students found a few odometry implementations online and they settled on one that actually worked. Now, maybe I'm ignorant, but some of the solutions looked overly complex or had complicated explanations behind them. So I sat down with a blank sheet of paper and a pencil in search for a more straightforward and similar solution based on first principles. After tossing out a few pages with false starts, it all fell into place. In the end, all the math needed actually fit on two handwritten pages. So let's look at the details. This is a Stravel chassis from GoBuilder that we have passed around between the members of the software team and it made it to my house at some point in the fall. 
The four drive motors are tucked into the channels that make up the chassis. The motors are powered by the ref controller, but no encoder cables are connected. Instead, the three auto parts are plugged into the encoder ports on the ref controller. The ref encoders that we use on the auto parts work exactly the same way the motor encoders do, but have a 3.3 volt output and can be directly connected to the controller without any level shifters. Here are some close up pictures. The Omni wheels have a 60 millimeter diameter. That's a number we will need later on. Now let's look into odometry. So from our cars, we know there's an odometer building that records the miles driven or kilometers driven irrespective of any direction. And that's probably important when we want to sell the car so that, you know, the prospective buyer knows what to pay for the car and what not. So with the robot, it's a bit different. With the robot, it can move in X and Y, and we want to record actually how the robot moves on the field and where it ends up being. The robot may start over here and then go here and go here. So we record all those waypoints until the final destination. And then once we have recorded all those, we can sum them up and we know where the robot is on the field exactly. The first thing we need is to define some coordinate systems. In looking at the Vuforia code, I found that they're using this corner as their origin. And then this direction here is the x-axis and this direction here is the y-axis. So the robot may be turned and at a different place on the field. The robot's coordinate system is based on the two auto wheels and we're going to pick right the middle here as the origin and it will become clear later why. This is just a convenient place for the origin to be. And then this will be our X direction and this will be the Y direction for the robot. And so the last thing is we need also to define the angle by which the robot is turned relative to the field. And that angle is denoted with a Greek letter theta and it describes the heading of the robot. I will use that term later on quite a bit. Let's take a look at all the steps we need for the odometry. So we do have field coordinates and then we have robot coordinates and then we also have three encoders on the robot that will give us the measurements we need. And let me take the robot out of here so we can see a little bit better. So the three encoders give us encoder ticks. I'm going to call them N1, N2, and N3. And let's say the robot moves from its initial position to a new position. So we'll have a new X axis, a new Y axis, and it also turns, let's say a little bit. So it goes from a start position to a new position. And that means the encoders will have new values. Out of those values, we can then compute a delta X the robot moved and a delta Y the robot moved. And then also it may have turned just like a little bit by a delta theta. So this is all in robot coordinates based on the encoder readings. We get delta X, delta Y and delta theta. And then the last step we need to do is translate those into new field coordinates. So we start out at, let's say, x0, y0, theta0, and then we end up up here at x1, y1, and theta1. So from the encoders, we get new robot coordinates, and from the robot coordinates, we can translate those into field coordinates. And we do that over and over basically by 100 times per second or 20 times per second, however fast we can read those values 
out of the encoders. We update the delta axis, delta y, delta theta, and then with those we update the field coordinates. So we get from one position on the field to a new position. And we just keep adding those up and follow the path of the robot on the field. Let's take a quick detour and talk about radians. So we're all used to angles expressed in degrees running from 0 to 360 degrees. But there is a much, much better way in dealing with angles in science and engineering. So let's take a robot that travels on a circle with a radius r. And the length of this arc here can be expressed as a fraction of the whole circle times 2 pi r. If you look at this term now here, this is exactly the arc length on a unit circle that corresponds to the angle alpha here. And so this piece here can also be thought of as an angle in radians. So the formula here then simply becomes L equals theta times r, which is a whole lot simpler. So theta is the angle in radians, which is the length of the arc on a unit circle. Radians are unitless numbers, and they run from 0 to pi over 2 to pi to 3 pi over 2, all the way to 2 pi for the whole circle. Finally, some equations. Let's start with the robot here and then look at the encoders. Let me take the robot away and then also add a coordinate system. So in between encoder one and two, we have our origin. I call that point A here. Encoder one and two, they're a distance L apart and encoder three sits a distance B in front of the center of one and two. Let's assume now the robot moved a little bit here to a new location. It moved from here to a new location B, and that means basically it moved a little bit in X direction, a delta X, a little bit in Y direction, that's delta Y, and it may have turned just a little bit I'm going to call it delta theta here. We need to keep in mind that the encoders are mounted on omni wheels. So encoder one and two only count if the wheels move in X direction. And encoder wheel three will only count when moved in Y direction. During the move, encoder wheel one will travel from here to here by a distance S1. So this can be thought of a superposition of a move and a little turn here. And since encoder wheel one only records in X direction, it will be delta X. And since it's turning backwards, in this case, it's minus L over two times delta theta. So that's where the radians come in handy. In a similar way, encoder wheel two will go here and then turn a little bit. So that's S2 equals delta X plus L over two times delta theta. And finally, encoder wheel three will move and turn, and this can only record in Y direction. So it's delta Y plus B times delta theta. Now we need the relationship between the encoder ticks and a distance traveled. In our case, the omni wheels have a radius of three centimeters and the ref encoders give us 8,192 ticks per revolution. So that may be different in your case. Now, if we have between two readings, a difference of delta N ticks, we get the distance traveled by dividing that 
by the ticks per evolution times 2 pi r. So that's our distance traveled. Since r and n are constant, we can combine 2 pi r over n into constant c. So our distance travel will become c times delta n. And c is how many centimeters the omniwheel travels per tick. So we can plug that in into our equations up here. So S1 becomes C times delta N1. S2 becomes C times delta N2. And S3 equals C times delta N3. In each loop in our software, we get new values for N1, N2, and N3. And we compare them with the values from the previous loop. So we get the differences delta in one, delta in two, and delta in three. So those are given by the software. And what we're looking for are the values for delta x, delta y, and delta theta. So we have three equations for three unknown variables that we can solve. So that's equation one, equation two, and equation three. Adding equations one and two eliminates the delta theta terms and we get for delta x c times delta n1 plus delta n2 over two. If we subtract equation one from equation two we can eliminate the delta x's and we get the delta theta as c times delta n2 minus delta n1 over l. So I'm going to call that equation 4 and equation 5. And if we now stick equation 5 into equation 3, we will get delta y equals c times delta n3 minus b delta n2 minus delta n1 over l and that's my equation number six so delta x is only depending on delta n1 and the encoder 2 delta theta is also only depending on encoder 2 and encoder 1 and delta y depends on all three encoder values. So to summarize the whole thing, in our program we loop and we take encoder readings at a time t and then a little bit later in the next loop we read the encoder values again. So that's at t plus delta t and the delta t may be five milliseconds, maybe 20 milliseconds, depending on how much work we have to do in those loops. And then the difference between those two will tell us how much the encoder advanced between the two readings. So we get delta N1, delta N2, and delta N3. And based on those values, we can then compute the delta X, the delta theta, and the delta Y. And keep in mind, those are all robot coordinates. This is telling us how much the robot moved in its coordinate system. The next thing we need to do is translate that into field coordinates. The robot starts at x0, y0 and is turned by an angle theta0 relative to the field. And it will end up at x1, y1 with a new turn angle of theta1. For those familiar with vector notation, the new position can be obtained by adding a rotated displacement of the robot to the old position. We can also rewrite this in the following form. So those equations can be plugged into our code directly the way they are. Finally, the new turn angle theta1 or the heading of the robot can be obtained by adding the delta theta to the old delta theta zero. As a note on the side, the scale of the drawing is way, way out of proportion. Typically, the delta x's and the delta y, they're in the maybe centimeter range, depending on how fast the robot moves. 
the delta theta probably at the max maybe one or two degrees not more so we're really dealing with very tiny values here and that's the whole purpose of the exercise we move just a tiny bit add it up move a tiny bit add it up and so on and we sum up the whole path of the robot in this way finally we're looking at some code here this is the strafer chassis from go builder it has a front a back a left and a right and three odometry wheels connected to the encoder ports this is a code snapshot probably taken toward the end of the ultimate goal season and i have taken the robot hardware class and boiled it down to the essentials needed just for the odometry leaving out other things like intake shooter and the control of the volvo goal arm up here we define the variables for the motors and the odometry encoders. Though the odometry encoders are plugged into the motor ports, we want to use different names so that we can keep those things, the motors and the odometry encoders separate. So to initialize the whole thing, we are initializing the motors and we set them to run without encoders because the encoders will be used for odometry. And then we assign the encoders to the motors based on the ports where the encoders are plugged in. Moving down here, we can see all the constants that define the geometry of the robot. L is the distance between encoder 1 and 2, that's the left and right encoder. B is the distance between the midpoint of encoder 1 and 2 and the encoder 3 that we call aux encoder here. Then R is the radius of the encoder omni wheel in centimeters and N are the encoder ticks per revolution of the ref controller and then the centimeters per tick we get by multiplying uh, 2 pi r over n that is what i called c in the derivation of the math next we need variables for the old and the current position meaning the old is the location of the robot or the encoder values in the previous loop and the current positions are captured here. We are using what we call an XYH vector class, which is basically keeping track of the robot's position on the field and its heading. It also has a few useful functions to do arithmetic with those values or to control the robot on the field, but I will not go into details here. That will be something for another video. So we are keeping track of the position with one of those x, y, h vectors here. The odometry function does all the heavy lifting now and it's being called in the main loop of the robot program. So we first make a note of the old positions from the previous loop. Then we read the current positions based on the encoder values. Next, we get the delta in one, delta in two, and delta in three from the difference between the current and the previous positions. From that, we can compute the delta theta, delta x, and delta y's. And then we can add them up to our current position based on the delta x, delta y. And the theta, we in this case, we have split into half. So we're adding half of the delta theta. Then we do an update of the x and y. And then we add the delta theta to the heading. As you can see here, we actually did experiment limiting the theta to plus minus pi or equivalent plus minus 180 degrees but we abandon it here it creates headaches left and right when the robot turns multiple times and goes over that boundary so we decided to keep track of that in the code where we actually control the robot let's say during autonomous movements so finally 
let's look at an actual test program that drives the robot. So this is a teleop using linear op mode. We like linear op modes because that gives us the greatest flexibility in programming the robot. So down here we have our main loop and inside the main loop we call the odometry function. And that will in each loop update the position of the robot. For debugging purposes, we print out the left, right, and aux positions of the encoders. So those are the raw encoder values. And then in the next line, we print the position of the robot in centimeters on the field and the robot heading in degrees. We like degrees here because if in radians it says like 0.78, that would be 90 degrees. 0.78, I cannot know what that means, but 90 degrees, I know. Uh, finally, up here, we have some code to drive the robot. So stick driving means we use the gamepad to drive the robot manually. And then we have some code that can put the robot to certain positions on the field, pre-programmed positions. So pressing the A button goes to a target position and pressing the B button goes back to a zero position, for instance. Let's see the robot in action now. First, we will look into calibrating the constant L. Got an initial value of exactly 20 centimeters when measuring the distance between the left and right encoder wheels by hand. Then, we had the robot spin around its axis 10 times. The final measurement angle was off by 23 degrees or 2.3 degrees per rotation. The value of L had to be nudged up to 20.12 centimeters for an optimal calibration. Similar adjustments can be made for the other parameters. In one of the first tests, I had the robot go two tiles forward, one tile to the left, and turn counterclockwise by 90 degrees. As you can see, it worked pretty well right out of the box. And here, the whole odometry in action during our first remote qualifier. Three, two, I hope this video will help you implement your own odometry solution. Do I think my algorithm is the best one out there? <laughs> no, not at all. But it is a simple solution that works well enough. So how could we improve the system? Some people have suggested to use bulk reads to get the data from the robot into the ref controller. That would speed up the data transfer and it would improve the cycle times. Or Steven and Peter from Glutenfree, yep, those two guys again, instead of using little triangles and turns, they use arcs in between the updates to approximate the path of the robot. In any case, there are other challenges that may have a bigger impact on your robot's performance. For instance, how do you implement a good path following algorithm? Or how fast and accurate can you approach a target with your robot? Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, good luck, first tech challenge teams.